one uh, model file, one MDL or MDX file or SLX file, and uh, and then we use virtual subsystems and we build this up. And this works really well for a while until you get somewhere between five and ten thousand blocks, and there's more than one person working on it. When you start to get to that size, whether it's an individual model or it's a team working on models, you're having multiple models, you have different data files you need to load in, there's paths. Sometimes if you're sophisticated, you even think about your revision control. And there are libraries. And there's a lot more elements that you want to work and you want to work seamlessly with inside the Simulink environment. And then you get to a point where there's a team of people that are working and now you have projects you need to think about reuse or actually using something that's been already validated. Um, there's requirements that you need to link to. There's parallel development going on. You want commonality of the environments and uh, you want to share more of the, uh, either the models or the libraries. And then lastly, you're getting into team-based development and then you need to actually integrate into change request management corporate database and you want to, to integrate in with a, a product lifecycle system. So when, when MathWorks talks or Systematics talk about large scale models, we sort of think about these things as they grow. <clears throat> Starting from a single, single large model file all the way up to a, com a complete sort of integrated system for development or an IDE for development. Another question that gets often asked is, you know, what is, what is considered large by the developers? And, and so when MathWorks developers sit down to work on making sure that the tools scale for large development, they're, they're talking about a project that's too big for a single engineer. And when they think about these types of models, they're thinking about greater than 10,000 blocks, or that if you have libraries, there's more than 10 people, 10, 10 customers for those libraries. And there can be upwards of more than five engineers editing, or 15 engineers using the models, or 20 components per model. And these are all meant to kind of give you a sense of not so much of the minimum number, the max, you know, that, but, but how we try to scale up the tools to work. So within our test environment, we have million block models that have been shared with us from customers around the world. And uh, also teams of engineers uh, within the MathWorks and Systematics routinely work on, together collaboratively across borders uh, in large groups uh, to, to both test the tool and to, to build uh, demonstrations so that we can work on these types of problems. And then lastly, it requires a high degree of overhead and coordination. So I think as we all know that when you're in school and you start working on engineering problems, it's pretty straightforward to, to work on a particular problem and that one of the first things you encounter pretty much when you get out of school and start working as a practicing engineer is that you're working on teams and that there's multiple, there's multiple disciplines going on. And people, you try to reuse what you can and invent what you have to and that there are different versions and different configurations um, of, of different components that you need to put together. Uh, my first experience was working on, uh, on engines where we had versions for two, uh, four cylinders, six cylinders, and eight cylinders, and we had five speed and six speed transmissions, uh, and we were building up mathematical models of these different components. So some of the essential technologies and modeling that, that you should a friend of mine says, the first thing to do when you know you're going to build a very large model is to stop and think about how you want to architect that model. And, and he has sort of three basic philosophies. One is to think about the componentization, the eventual integration you're going to have, and then the coordination. So componentization is there to sort of reduce the overall complexity. It's, it's a classic engineering uh, approach, which is to take something very complicated and chunk it down into and at the same time, you're going to need to bring these things back together. So you want to specify the interfaces between the different components. And lastly, you need to have some sort of version control. And again, none of these things are, uh, as my college professor used to say, rocket science. But they're all things that if you come back to them after you've been building the model, you will have trouble with. So Simulink has several different ways uh, to, uh, to create components. First is a virtual subsystem, and this is the one that we're all fairly used to. This is where you can sort of group a, a number of Simulink objects together and then sort of hide them graphically. But that's all it is, is it's a graphical uh, element. Uh, when Simulink goes to uh, compile the model or an update diagram, essentially it flattens out all virtual subsystems. 
So these are not true sort of subsystems or componentization. They're just sort of visual. The next one is an atomic subsystem. And Simulink will execute an atomic subsystem as sort of as a chunk. And you can, uh, there's a certain um, amount of property inheritance uh, that go on. But it's still all included in a single, mo uh, single file. And the last one is, is a model block. And there's two parts to this. One, it's executed as a unit, similar to an atomic subsystem. Uh, but the boundaries are, are established, and there's no inheritance. And it actually also creates a separate file. And so when you're going to start to build these very large systems and you're architecting them, thinking about what parts need to execute as units also and what parts need to be stored separately as separate model files uh, to, to fit into your uh, file-based uh, configuration management system are So what's, what, what are some of the parti additional partitioning technologies? In addition to model reference, there's also signals uh, and bus objects. And some of our best uh, recommendations are in terms of sort of one file per component uh, in a revision control. So if you have one, one common question when a model scales up or when a project scales up is what type of revision control uh, do MathWorks use? So MathWorks uses SVN. We use a lot of different types of revision control storing our models as different things is SVN. But it can fit within any type of revision control. The critical thing is to actually figure out what size component you want to use and where you want these boundaries. The other, the other um, technology is libraries. And libraries support uh, graphical reuse only. Um, so they actually create multiple copies. So the thing about a model block is we often refer to them as model reference because when you put a multiple copies in, they're still all referencing one file. Whereas if you have a library, it creates multiple instantiations that essentially trace back to a library element. And this, we'll get into this in a minute, but that can lead to very different behaviors uh, when you go to partition uh, a model. So let me talk about libraries versus model reference for a sec. Model reference in libraries, when to choose which. Uh, I think when, if, if you're like me and you were using Simulink uh, since its inception, you were introduced to libraries long before you were introduced to model reference. And libraries uh, essentially are the same type of technology that um, block sets are, are based off of. And so a lot of times when you're building up a palette, you'll think about building up a palette from a library. And this can be a bit of a challenge, be, and, and we'll get into it, but the things to consider are the frequency of edits, where you want the boundaries to be, there's some impact on simulation performance, and then some, uh, some componentization uh, choices that you need to make in addition to reuse. So in terms of the frequency of edits, when you're going to edit something fairly regularly or independently, our recommendation is to, to use model reference. And that, that's because essentially, as I mentioned, model reference is unique files, unique models, uh, that when you check in to a CM system or you, you publish, uh, that's the time that others would use them. Whereas libraries essentially create an instantiation copy, but if you're going to edit the library, you have to break all the library links. And one of the most common problems that, uh, that engineers around the world uh, bump into when using a lot of libraries is that the library links are broken. And so when the update diagram gets done, the latest version of the isn't pulled into the model. Uh, the other thing to the other thing to consider too is uh, the impact on simulation performance. So as I mentioned, libraries create multiple instantiation copies. So if you're going to have a million copies of the same block, all roughly doing the same thing, and it's in a library, it's going to it's going to essentially explode the size of the model. Whereas if you're, if you're just referencing uh, it, one, one copy, it keeps the model more compact. And also the model reference gets compiled. And therefore, there, there's an impact on simulation speed um, with, with the choices. That doesn't mean that model reference will speed up your model. It does mean, though, under certain architectures, your model reference will run faster than The other, the other um, experience that MathWorks engineers have and, and that we recommend is sort of this um, hierarchy of, of library components. And so 
uh, that, that a component sort of stores in its own library and that then those library, individual component libraries are, are put together in terms of a, of a palette that gets used on a particular project and then the, the, the project library gets, uh, gets used on the model. And I'll, I'll explain, explain a little bit of why that is um, next. But um, one of, uh, just to sort of, again, sort of continue to reiterate, when you're using libraries versus using model reference, it'll create copies. And this is sort of the best example that, that we have to try to explain that challenge. If you have a model, and within that model, there are three copies of, of a library function called utility. And one copy is in um, the uh, model reference block A, one copy is in B, and there are two copies in, in, the, uh, in the model file. And you're going to end up, when you generate code, with three copies. And a couple things will happen along the way, too. There'll be two copies inside the model, uh, and two in, in individual copies inside of the model reference blocks. So the model will contain at least two copies, and the code will contain three copies because each of the individual components will generate code, which my colleague doesn't know. If instead, and this is where I was getting to why we recommend that you have libraries with single elements, if you have a library of model reference blocks, then a similar type of structure where the utility function is actually a model reference sitting inside of a library, now each of the model reference blocks uh, links back to the library and the instantiations inside the model point back to the library, you'll, you'll get only one copy, both in terms of the way the models run and in terms of the way the code is generated. Because the model reference essentially creates a unit and creates a referenceable object uh, within both model and code. And again, this will have an impact on the speed of the model, the update diagram, um, and the code generation. So, this is, this is why when, uh, when I started off with sort of the seemingly brilliantly obvious comments that how you partition things really matter, uh, this, is, this is the impact that that can have. So if, if when starting you identify utilities or, or objects that are going to have multiple copies, you can have a long-term impact on the way the model runs. So on a car, we tend to, we tend to put wheels and tires, essentially things that will have multiple also, any of the, the sort of um, <coughs> functional utilities that you're going to create along the way. And again, my colleague. Um, so sort of moving out of that, I'm going to try to um, get into a little bit of the configuration management aspects. So again, the, the idea of configuration management uh, from the MathWorks perspective and what we try to build the tools to work on is that you'll have sort of multiple streams um, going and that uh, you'll have different, different parts of the model that can be revised along the way um, and different configurations or revisions of, of multiple models and then finally get to a release point. And along the way also that you'll have different configurations in, in addition to different revisions and different branching. And uh, from, from this perspective, you could have branches per release, you could have branches per project, and, and we look at the fact that you'll, you'll be building uh, these types of uh, configurations along the way. So project solutions uh, for, for version control and configuration management. The first thing that we, we work on as, as, uh, as engineers inside the MathWorks and that we think about is the difference between version control and configuration management. So version control, every, every different model element will, may have a different version, and as you build up different models, you'll be into different configurations. And again, these things are blindingly obvious if you've ever built large models. But using model reference allows you to break things down into chunks and then share them and reference them. Um, and uh, as, as I've mentioned several times, using libraries to manage sort of the subcomponents that get you, that you want multiple copies of, but that are edited in terms of time. So the typical question is, does this work well? Do we have any experience? And our answer is sort of a resounding yes. That, that model reference, when you have one file per component, and libraries with one file per subcomponent, these are our best practices. And bus objects 
uh, for serialized in the file. Simulating parameter objects can be saved as exter external files, and parameters can be stored inside of these uh, map files. And, and in doing these things, once you've set up the architecture properly, models can scale up uh, to very large program levels. Uh, Simulink also can link into the various uh, version control tools. Um, for me, I, I like to use the model info block uh, where you can publish the information uh, that can also be sort of captured inside of um, uh, model properties block. And then um, lastly, there's a, there's a tool that, uh, like I said, doesn't get a great deal of uh, marketing love called the manifest tool. And what the manifest tool will do is it'll produce a, a, what, uh, what we refer to as a cargo list. And from let me get to it. Um, what it does is it actually will interrogate a model. It'll determine all of the files that are needed and produce a manifest. It'll determine the block sets and the toolboxes that are used that you can determine. So somebody asked uh, um, the other day, one of the challenges that, uh, that engineers typically have when they receive models is they don't know if they have licenses to run all the different toolboxes or block sets that are buried deeply inside of the uh, model. And they'll get a model, they'll update the diagram, and they'll get a whole bunch of errors. And if you're lucky, the errors will make some sense. If you're unlucky, they don't, you know, you'll read them and you'll try to figure out what's missing. And the manifest tool will actually tell you which versions of the toolboxes and block sets were used in the model. So you sure that you've got a consistent, again, a, a consistent uh, build. It'll also let you know, um, it'll wrap up stuff along the path that's uh, been specifically built, and then it'll produce a report, and it'll zip it all up. And so this uh, allows you to sort of share models within groups in a way that you can understand what's being delivered to you. Uh, the uh, last one is that, uh, in working with customers around the world, there's a few things that we've discovered that you want to preserve in addition to the model. And these we refer to as sort of process artifacts, or artifacts that get produced along uh, the way, uh, typically. So typically, you want to preserve, in case something goes wrong, model manifest. And again, that gives you the full list of everything that went into the model that you built. Um, model checking, so any, um, any custom tools that you built, the requirements, but a couple of the other things that, that, that typically um, are considered derived but should be kept are, are the code generation logs and uh, the, the code checks and the derived.